morning everybody. We're going to jump right in and start part one of the chemical analysis of urine. Um, splitting up this lecture just because it is, I want to say, 80 some odd slide length um, and I want to keep it a more reasonable uh, length for you. So when we talk about urinalysis, um, we're going to talk about, you know, obviously we start with reagent strip testing, uh, but I want you to really pay close attention to the chemical reactions that are happening on each reagent pad. This is an example of the reagent strip, and in each of these pads, these have all of the chemicals and all of the reagents that are required for each different chemical reaction. And a lot of these are going to be repeated when we talk about um, clinical biochemistry in the serum testing or serum and urine testing and a larger platform um, utilizing um, immunoassays or enzymatic methods or um, different colorimetric or nephilometry methods. So you really need to pay close attention to this because this is almost your introduction to clinical biochemistry. So each reagent strip, we, we often call them dipsticks, um, and it's basically a little plastic piece, so this is the hold end, um, with small plastic pads attached to it, and then each of these pads, um, and they, if you actually touch it, it, see, it feels like fuzzy. Um, not that I've touched one without um, a glove on in the lab, but it's the same thing if you have a pool or a spa, um, your pH strips where you um, test the chemicals in your um, hot tub. So we can test all of these analytes all at once, um, and we're looking at uh, pH, protein, glucose, ketones, blood, bile, uh, urobilinogen, nitrate, leukocyte esterase, or white blood cells, um, and specific gravity. Uh, gravity. Um, and then each of the colors that are generated will vary according to the concentration of the analyte um, and some test um, strips. So the color will vary a tiny bit, so you need to make sure that you're reading the strip based off of the correct reagent bottle. So a lot of the times I've seen videos where they just throw the stick in and they leave the dipstick in the urine. We can't do that. Um, so basically, um, for our intents and purposes, we're going to utilize just the hand dipping in lab. We do have some small analyzers that you will get to try. And then if we can get you out on clinical either this semester or the fall semester as part of your hematology rotation, um, you'll see the automated um, urinalysis um, instruments. So basically you're going to dip the entire strip and you want to be careful because you want to make sure that you get this all the way in um, so the glucose is usually the top strip um, and they they put them in order of how long it takes um, for the test to develop um, so you, these are flexible so you kind of push it in you can bend them a little bit to get that last glucose pad underneath it then as you take it out you're going to drag along the edge so wicking off any excess and then you're basically going to tap it sideways onto a paper towel um, to get any excess off and then you're going to hold it straight out okay you want to hold it flat and straight and as you get ready to read um, the timing will be um, set by your manufacturer um, but basically anywhere from 30 seconds and then the leukocyte esterase is usually the longest at two minutes um, so here's an example of holding it flat and you don't want to place it on this reagent container um, because obviously this reagent container is for multiple strips you don't want to literally coat the entire thing with um, urine um, and basically as you read it you can turn like turn it this way uh, turn the reagent bottle this way hopefully you can see my arrow as I, I scribble um, and you read from bottom to top so this is glucose right here this is leukocyte esterase up here and you utilize this crossway to compare the colors and for each of these little squares it's going to give you the equivalent of the result that you have so like this all the way up here I believe is protein I can't read it that small um, but any type of like green color here for this strip would be um, protein that's present um, any changes to green or brown would be um, glucose is present 
Um, so basically, um, we have to read these results at the exact same time as the chart because uh, because of the limitations and, and the effects of air and temperature on some of these reactions because um, these are um, some enzymatic reactions, especially our glucose oxidase um, and our leukocyte esterase for the detection of glucose and white blood cells in urine. Um, these are enzymatic reactions are directly impacted by changes in temperature, changes in pH. Um, so you have to be really careful about um, reading them exactly. So when we get towards the end of the semester and you have your practical exam, you get four minutes to do two full urine dipsticks. And that's it because that's, oh, you get five minutes because I give you some prep time. Um, but you shouldn't need any more time because you can't have any more time. We can't extend it. Otherwise, the tests would be invalid. So, for this to be accurate, reagent strips um, have to be stored in their bottle, lid closed tightly um, at room temperature. We can't expose them to sunlight or heat or cold or any volatile substances and moisture. So, each bottle will have a desiccant pack. When you get into lab, you'll all get an empty bottle. I will have the main bottle. I will give you the strips that you need each lab. Now, I know this, uh, I will remind you as we get closer to lab because I know, um, you know, for this semester we're not in lab yet, but um, you always need to check the strips because you want to make sure to see if there's any discolored pads um, or they just don't look right or they look brown because typically that means they've been exposed to something and they're not valid anymore. Um, for our purposes in lab, we will use expired reagent strips just because we get things donated and we want to keep you know our budget down so your lab fees can stay low um, but you want to make sure that in the real world that you don't ever use expired reagent strips um, so typically um, we also want to make sure that our urine is brought to room temperature um, and I'm gonna pause for a second to see if any of you know why or if you remember what I just said think about it all right, so if you have your answer, hopefully you do, um, and hopefully you listen to me on the last slide. I know I talk a lot, and I talk ahead of PowerPoints, um, but remember, a lot of these are enzymatic reactions, and enzymatic reactions are directly impacted by what? Changes in temperature and changes in pH. So enzymes are a lot slower when they're cold, okay? So you may miss and have some false results because of that. Um, so this is an example. This is that brownish color. Um, this is the air exposed reagent strip. So you want to always check that. Um, and sometimes we can see discoloration um, of expired um, strips as well. Uh, so we always have to make sure because even um, for even for us, we're not using expired strips with discolored test um, strip pads because that's just not going to work and we're going to get false reactions and that's going to impact your lab grade um, because your lab grade is based off of the results that you get. So, sorry, i got to get that out of the way. Um, you can tell I have waiting to see if anybody needs me. All right, so now this is introducing our urine pH. So uh, we'll talk more about pH um, in clinical biochem, um, but basically our kidneys are part of our buffering system um, where we regulate acid and base balance because we don't want our body to be too acidic or too uh, basic uh, because our organs would shut down and not function appropriately. Um, so um, we, our kidneys will basically excrete acids and alkalis or uh, reabsorb them based on the body's pH. Um, so this function is reflected in the pH of urine because our main function um, is to get rid of hydrogen ion. Um, so our pH would be a little more acidic um, and you know, sometimes we can see that fluctuation between acidic and alkaline, um, but it's not going to remain constant because your kidneys are always going to be changing that based on your body's acid base status. Um, so we typically don't have an abnormal range. Um, so basically what we would utilize is we'd look at this urine pH with all of the other urine strip results and potentially um, blood results and signs and symptoms to really put together an overall picture. Um, you know, urinalysis, um, you, you think like, okay, well, it's just a dipstick. We're just, you know, dipping pee. But this is a very quick and easy and non-invasive test that can point the doctor's finger in the right direction to figure out what's wrong with the patient. 
So, whoops. Um, so when we look at our urine pH, um, we basically um, will have an acid and alkaline indicator, and this is literally almost the exact same thing that you would see um, checking your, your spa or your pool um, pH. So our acid indicator is our methyl red, and the alkaline is our bromothymol blue, and we're going to read it about 60 seconds. Now remember, this is just an average. Um, some manufacturers can change the, the read time, so don't memorize the read time. You always follow the instructions. Um, and the pH um, that we're detecting in urine is going to range from five to eight and a half. Um, and we only report in half units. Um, so we can use like if they're really actually getting into, um, you know, more depth that they want to get a, a closer, more accurate uh, measurement, we can use a pH meter. These have glass electrodes. Um, some places will actually just report the urine as acidic, neutral, or alkaline instead of actually giving out these numerical numbers. So why do we care about urine pH? Well, if we have persistent acidity, um, we can see this in patients, you know, in a variety of things. If they're on, you know, acidifying drugs, all the way down to dehydration, diarrhea, gout, wicked high protein diets, like, um, oh, I can't remember, not the keto diet, um, that will show ketones in the urine. Um, but, um, though the Atkins diet with the high protein diet, you can also see the, the high P, uh, the, uh, acidic pH, um, often, and then pulmonary emphysema as well. And that's tip that is directly related to, um, the acid base balance. So your acid base buff, one of the buffering system is, um, your lungs and your kidneys, um, or the bicarbonate system. And if your lungs are compensated, the, the kidneys are going to try and pick up the slack and, and, and com compensate for the lack of lung function. Um, so typically, um, we want to make sure that we are looking at, again, the urine pH with other information because we really can't do anything with just the urine pH alone. Um, we can see persistent alkalinity with alkaline drugs, acute and chronic renal failure, um, renal tubular acidosis, use, UTIs, um, you know, use of diuretics, um, things like that. Um, so these can kind of help point in the direction of a patient problem. But again, we can't use it alone. So now we move into urine protein. Um, so in um, the normal kidney, we're typically only going to see a small amount of low molecular weight protein um, that's filtered at the glomerulus. Um, so basically that whole structure of that glomerular membrane is going to prevent any high molecular weight um, proteins from being excreted into the urine, including our albumin, because albumin is actually um, a large um, protein molecule. Um, so after filtration, most of our protein is reabsorbed into the tubules because um, our body is really good at recycling and we want to reuse protein. We want to get that back to the liver. We want to break it down to the amino acid and use those building blocks for something else. Um, so we can, um, typically we're going to see less than 150 milligrams per 24 hours being excreted. Um, and then less than a hundred, um, in a little kid. Um, and typically the normal protein that we see is what's called a TAM horsefall protein. Um, it's not contained in the plasma, but it's secreted by the renal tubules. Um, and as we get into, um, the microscopic analysis of urine, this protein will form the matrix of most of our urinary casts. And I'll explain to you exactly what those are um, in the next chapter. So when we test for protein, this is kind of fun because it's well, fun. I guess it's your, your, your definition of fun. Um, but basically, this is something that they love to test you on your certification exam. Um, but your protein is read by the protein error of indicators. And we're utilizing um, the pH indicator. So basically, we look for a color change um, and... It basically in with pH indicators because it's different in the presence of protein than normally observed. Um, protein will act as a hydrogen ion acceptor at a constant pH. So usually the indicator is going to change from a yellow to blue or green um, between a pH of three and four. But in the presence of protein, the color change will occur between two and three. So this presence of protein is an, provides an error um, in the behavior of the indicator. So that's how we're detecting it. So we're detecting this color change because of the error that the protein um, causes in the reagent strip. 
Um, so typically we're using the tetrabromphenol blue. Um, so reagent strips that are detecting primarily air, um, albumin, um, they're, so they're less sensitive to globulins. Um, and typically we are seeing protein because of glomerular damage. So something has happened to the kidneys, whether it's you know actual physical trauma or disease degradation, um, we're not going to normally see a large amount of protein in the urine unless that is present. Present. Um, so we can see gamma globulins, glycoproteins, lysosomes, hemoglobin, um, and then Benz Jones pro, uh, proteins. These are uh, much less readily detected than albumin. Um, so a negative urinary dipstick doesn't rule out necessarily the presence of all of these other proteins. <coughs> Excuse me. We have other tests that will help detect that. So. How do we see false protein, um, urine protein false positives? Um, we can see false positives in highly buffered alkaline urine. So if they are on meds or it's old, it's been sitting for a little while. Um, if it, there's been prolonged exposure to the sample, so you're reading it too late. Um, if there's been um, it collected into a, a container that's used cleaning compounds like ammonia, um, other drugs, um, other plasma expanders, and then um, blood pro, uh, blood has protein, so that will cause a false positive. Um, your skin cleansers, your chlorhexidine gluconate, can also cause a false positive as well. Um, a false negative, uh, an extremely dilute urine, or you have protein present that's not albumin. So what's the significance of protein in the urine? Um, so we can see different causes. So exercise can cause it, stress can cause it, exposure to heat or extreme heat or cold, fever and pregnancy can cause it. Um, all of these can cause increased um, protein in the urine. Um, and not necessarily mean that they have some sort of renal disorder. Um, pathology or pathologic causes, so disease causes, would be things like glomerulonephritis, pyelonephritis, and malignant hypertension. So these can be the first sign of a serious problem, um, and they can come far earlier than any other signs and symptoms. Um, so this is something that, you know, the urinalysis result is, is really useful at the first you know, kind of warning to a doc, like, hey, you might want to look a little closer at this. Um, and we do have other renal disorders um, that don't have protein, um, but there are other tests that we can utilize to detect those as well. So now we move into urine glucose. So normally this is present in our glomerular ultrafiltrate and we reabsorb it into the proximal tubule. And we're usually not seeing this at all in urine unless what's called this renal threshold um, levels are exceeded. Um, so if your renal threshold 160 to 180 milligrams per deciliter is exceeded, we can see urine uh, glucose spilling into the urine. So we see urine glucose and we detect it by our glucose oxidase, which uses, utilizes glucose oxidase and peroxidase. Um, so in the presence of glucose and oxygen with glucose oxidase, we produce gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. With this and the chromogen and peroxidase, we get an oxidized chromogen that will produce a color change that ranges from a light green green to brown. <clears throat> and we do have confirmatory tests for this as well, and we'll get into that as well. So we're typically reading glucose first at 30 seconds. Negative is just going to be that blue reagent pad. Um, so these reagent strips have your glucose oxidase. They detect only glucose, um, and they use a double sequential enzyme reaction that we showed um, you know, in the previous PowerPoint where you're, you're utilizing your glucose oxidase and your peroxidase. Um, chromogen that's used varies, um, but potassium iodide is the most common, and we read it 30 to 60 seconds depending on our manufacturer, and results are reported negative or to four, so or negative to 2,000 milligrams per deciliter depending on how the lab that you end up in reports it. So we can see false positives. Um, so again, those oxidizing cleaning agents, uh, peroxide, um, hypochlorite, if there's elevated urobilinogen in some automated methods, um, if the specimen is contaminated with strong oxidizing or cleaning agents, um, like peroxidize, you know, basically that can actually just take over the reagent strip and cause a false reaction. 
Um, and then here too, um, with our automated strips, um, this urobilinogen um, can interfere because of the color change. Um, false negatives, um, we can see obviously de decreased sensitivity in cool urine. Again, why? Oh, that's right, because it's cold. And alkaline urine, high ketone levels, because again, we're changing the pH there and enzymes are, are impacted by that. Um, you'll notice ascorbic acid or a vitamin C in high doses can also affect this. And you'll see this um, you know, causing um, false negative results in some other um, tests as well. And then um, you want to make sure um, that we really, really make sure that we are doing everything that we can to prevent this from happening. Um, we obviously can't control the vitamin C or the alkalinity levels or specific gravity, but we can make sure we bring this up to room temp. So this would be considered an operator error at that point. Um, other false negatives. Um, so we'll go specific gravity can decrease that sensitivity of the enzyme. Um, again, the pH enzyme, you know, decreased. Um, and we can see high ketone levels, um, and these are really high, um, that will cause false negatives um, with glucose levels of over 100 milligrams per deciliter. And I already told you about the ascorbate, so this will inhibit the enzymatic reaction, um, and then it will be oxidized by the hydrogen peroxide in the second. Um, so again, I talk ahead of the PowerPoints as always. Um, so typically, normal vitamin C isn't a problem, but you know if we have we're taking vitamin C because we're trying to prevent, well, at this point, it's not preventing the common cold. Most people are taking it to try and boost up their immune system to prevent um, getting COVID or getting too sick from COVID. Um, and antibiotics um, as well can have um, cause problems as well. So we're not going to do, um, you know, obviously if we suspect that there's high vitamin C levels, um, at least 24 hours after the last intake of vitamin C, and we should get um, results that are normal. So the other thing we can do is look at urine with reducing substances. Um, so other um, sugars like your fructose, galactose, lactose, and maltose, um, these are considered our, our reducing substances. Um, so we will other things um, like your dextrins, your homogenistic acid, glucuronides as well um, can give positive reduction tests. But basically, we are looking at the ability of glucose to reduce copper, um, and it will also detect these sugars if they are present, where on our reagent pad, we're only looking at glucose. So typically, we used to do, this is my favorite test, by the way, literally my favorite test to do. I mean, you can't go wrong with a test that bubbles, gets hot, and changes color right? Um, super fun, like crazy little kid science experiment. Um, but we're only going to typically do this now on um, newborns and newborn screening because we can pick up some of the inborn errors of metabolism um, earlier that way. So this is called the clinitest. So um, you have a couple different ways and, and we'll do these in lab um, where you're basically modifying your um, uh, urine. So whether you use two drops or five drops and you mix with water, you add the reagent tablet and it will literally bubble up, get hot. Um, so if you actually left your finger on it, it would burn you. Um, and it will proceed to a color change. So blue is your negative, And then you can see here, this is a green, which is a little positive all the way up to an orange brown. So this is also called a Benedict's test or a copper reduction test. Um, so typically we're using it to screen for those reducing substances. Um, and basically this test is based on that strongly alkaline solutions in the presence of heat, reducing sugars will reduce the cupric ions to cuprous oxide. Um, so we'll see a color change of blue through green to orange, depending on the amount of the reducing substances that are present in the urine. Um, it is a self-heating method, um, and we consider this a semi-quantitative um, method to determine the reducing substances. So the tablet itself has copper sulfate, citric acid, sodium hydroxide, sodium carbonate. So when we put it in a mixture of water and urine, it's dissolved by the sodium carbonate and citric acid. That's your effervescent, like your Alka-Seltzer. Um, the sodium hydroxide will provide the, that alkaline medium that we need, and then the heat um, is provided by the reaction of 
sodium hydroxide with water and citric acid. So then the reducing substances in the urine will then react with the copper sulfate to reduce the cupric ions to cuprous oxide. And then we report it as negative um, or a quarter, a half, three quarters, one, two percent, or negative trace one, two, three, four, depending on um, how your lab reports them out. Um, you have to be really careful because in large amounts um, of uh, reducing substances, we can see what's called a pass through. And this is basically, you have to look at it the entire time the reaction is occurring. Because if you don't see this, it literally will flash orange to dark brown and then it'll go all the way back down again um, so you can often miss a high reaction so if we're suspecting that this is a two percent we can also do a two drop method to get it a little lower to get a more accurate result to really get this um, and then we use a different color chart to read it um, but the two drop uh, will allow for quantitation up to 5%, but the pass through phenomenon can still occur. Um, so one will, pr so the regular uh, five drop is 2%, uh, but we can get up to 5% if we expect it's higher. So false positives in clinitest, ascorbic acid. Um, these have always been considered to give false positive results here, um, but we're not sure if this is 100% yet. Um, we can see nalodilic dixic acid. I can never say that one right. I talk too fast. Um, cephalosporins, things like that. Urinary preservatives like formalin or formaldehyde. Um, not that we use formaldehyde much anymore um, or at all. Um, these can cause false positives. Um, false negatives, so the only false negative is if you screw it up. So if we're following the directions, there's no other known substances that will interact um, to cause a false negative. So it's a very accurate and reliable test for reducing substances. So why do we care about urine glucose? Um, so it's not going to be present in the urine until the blood levels exceed 160 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, which is the normal renal threshold for glucose. So the presence of um, glucose in the urine is called glycosuria or glucosuria. Um, and the quantity of the glucose that appears in the urine is dependent upon the, glu the glucose level in the blood. How our glomerular filtration um, is um, working and the degree of tubular reabsorption that's occurring. So, when the glucose exceeds the renal threshold, the tubules can't reabsorb all of it, so glucose, glycosuria occurs. So, this normally we're not. Um, seeing this level exceeded even after we're ingesting a large amount of quad, uh, carbohydrate we can see a small amount of glucose um, present in normal urine but the fasting level in adult is only at about 2 to 20 milligrams of glucose per 100 mls of urine um, when we look at urine reducing uh, sugars um, we typically um, like I already previously mentioned we're looking at um, early detection for metabolic defects um, so whether we see um, excretion of reducing su uh, sugars like galactose um, which we'd see in a patient with galactosemia all right, so I'm going to finish up this lecture with urine ketones, and then we'll move into lecture two, and I will split it. I'll try and keep them at least a half hour or close to a half hour for each lecture. Um, so when we look at our urine ketones, the normal formation of our urine ketones um, is basically coming from the intermediate products of fatty acid. Um, your breakdown is acetyl coenzyme A. Um, your acetyl coenzyme A will enter the citric acid cycle. Remember that Krebs cycle from chemistry? Um, if the body, uh, in the body, if fat um, and carbohydrate degradation are appropriately balanced. So the first step in the Krebs cycle is the reaction of acetyl coenzyme A with um, oxaloacetate to yield citrate. Oops. Wow, that was kind of crazy sorry about that um, so the oxaloacetate will be used to form glucose when carbs um, are absent or improperly used and if there's no oxaloacetate um, available um, for uh, condensation with acetyl coenzyme A um, or we can't um, enter the Krebs cycle it's diverted into the formation of ketone bodies so that's our urine ketones or excessive formation and I apologize for the formatting on that 
So this is an example of your um, urine ketones. So here's your acetoacetic acid, um, your acetone, and your beta-hydroxybutyric acid. So when we look at our urine ketones, um, we're going to around 40 seconds or so. Um, and basically, this is your sodium nitroprusside. Um, so the basis of this test is where you're seeing your sodium nitroprusside um, and an alkaline buffer that are reacting with a diacetic acid. It'll form a... Um, uh, maroon color. Um, the ketone uh, results are red around 40 to 60 seconds. Um, color change is buff pink to maroon and the reaction is reported either negative trace, moderate or large um, or negative to 160 milligrams per deciliter depending on the lab. Um, some reagent strips will detect um, acetone um, but none will detect the beta hydroxybutyric acid um, so in this case you can see your acetoacetic acid your sodium nitroprusside with glycine in an alkaline ph will produce a violet purple color so in this uh, lecture your lecture code is two four three one two four three one so urine ketones um, false positive or atypical color um, can occur if we have um, urines that are highly pigmented um, if there's high specific gravity and low ph um, levodopa uh, metabolites self hydro groups phenyl ketones phthalene compounds um, and any positive and questionable results need to be confirmed by a tablet test um, false negatives, um, typically um, the multi-sticks, diascreen for diacetic acid, um, these will not give a positive ketone result with controls that have acetone. So our ketone confirmatory test is our acid test. Um, so again, we're reading the color change here, um, but basically this tablet has the sodium nitroprusside, glycine, and your alkaline buffer, just like um, the reagent strip, but lactose as well. Um, and we can use this to test urine, serum, plasma, or whole blood. The diacetic acid and acetone react with sodium nitroprusside um, and glycine in the alkaline medium to form a purple color. Lactose in the tablet will help enhance that color. Um, it's about 10 times more sensitive um, to diacetic acid than acetone, and it doesn't react with beta-hydroxybutyric acid. So we will report acid test as small moderate or large um, and we don't do the uh, the acid test as often any longer um, and basically um, the small color block will correspond to 50 to 10 milligrams per deciliter of diacetic acid moderate is 30 to 40 and large is 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter um, so ketone levels are usually really low, 2 to 4 milligrams per deciliter. That's where we want them to be. 20% um, acetoacetic acid, 2% acetone, and 78% beta-hydroxybutyric acid. Um, acetone is lost in the air at room temperature. Um, so normal amounts of ketones um, that are present um, are usually just okay. It's a small amount. Um, but the relative proportion of each is, again, that... Um, approximate percentages um, and we can see proportional variation among a lot of um, individuals so we say approximately 20 percent acetoacetic acid you get it um, acetone can be la lost in the air if we leave it standing at room temp um, so we have to test these urines immediately or refrigerate in a closed container until testing so our ketone significance so as you can imagine you're hearing this whole and you've heard the keto diet right so why we care about ketones in the urine? Well, if you have ketones in the urine, um, you can see it in diabetes, diarrhea, cold, fasting, fever, insufficient carb intake, malnutrition, strenuous exercise, vomiting. So the heart muscle and your renal cortex prefer to use acetoacetate uh, instead of glucose. But glucose is the major fuel of the brain in a well-nourished individual, even though the brain can adapt to utilize acetoacetic, uh, acetoacetate in the absence of glucose. So the odor of acetone can be detected in a breath of someone who has high levels of ketones in the blood um, because we're eliminating that acetone via the lungs. And then carb utilization problems can occur in other conditions just besides diabetes. 
All right, so we're going to pause that there, and I'm going to pick up urine, blood, and hemoglobin in lecture two.